A very good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online Lecture 305, Ocular Oncology Module Number 12. Today, we have with us Dr. Seema Das Ma'am from Shroff Charity Eye Hospital, Daria Ganj Delhi, to talk to us on tumors of the optic nerve. I think everybody in Ocular Oncology Fraternity knows Ma'am, but uh, just for the formality sake, uh, I'll just introduce her to the audiences. Uh, Dr. Seema Das Ma'am has done her MBBS from Lady Harding Medical College, New Delhi, and her post graduation from uh, the prestigious Mulana Azad Medical College. She went on to do her clinical fellowship in ophthalmic plastic surgery, orbit and ocular oncology at LV Prasad Eye Institute, Hyderabad. Currently, she's the in charge of ophthalmic plastic surgery, orbit and ocular oncology services at Dr. Shroff's Charity Eye Hospital in New Delhi. And she also heads the med medical education department in the same hospital. Her areas of interest include ophthalmic plastic surgery, ocular and adnexal tumors, specifically retinoblastoma, orbital diseases, and reconstructive oculofacial surgery and ophthalmic medical education. A very warm uh, welcome to you, ma'am. And uh, I hope... Uh, you are uh, ready with the slides, so over to you. Thank you, Shafali. Yeah, so this was a very, you know, impromptu sort of presentation. So I know the topic was uh, optic nerve tumors, but uh, um, since... Uh, I'm, I'm, you will be covering the portfolio of the cases also, right? <laughs> I will just cover a portfolio of cases. Um, try to cover a little bit more of the neurogenic tumors. And right. an interactive session. And I don't know if it's possible to sort of, you know, let the participants answer. Uh, sure here. Uh, Subhav, uh, Ruju and I are here. So probably we can discuss. And Rolika is also here. So we can discuss the same. All right, so what we'll do, we will go through uh, quickly just some cases of orbital tumors, um, talk about some of the cardinal signs and just uh, go through the management outlines. Uh, I believe we have already covered the uh, evaluation part um, and uh, the basic evaluation and the basic classification aspect. Uh, but just to recapitulate, Orbitino has a lot of different type of anatomical issues and tumors can arise from any of the structures. Uh, broadly, cystic lesions are the most common type, but then we have the vascular, neurogenic, myogenic, fibrosis, like ramal glands are a, a major chunk. Lymphoproliferative are one of the commonest one in adults. And then you have the secondary and the metastatic tumors, which can come from any other part of the body or from any of the surrounding structures. So Shifali, just let me know, uh, have you covered the cystic lesions? Uh, Ma'am, none of the lesions of the optic nerve has been covered. So probably you can just... Have you covered any other? Has been, ma'am. You can probably we can just have a revision, so not a problem. You can just go ahead with the flow of your presentation. Yes. No, absolutely yes. not an issue. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So uh, this we of course all know. These are the garden variety of the dermoid cyst of the orbit, usually in children. External angular being the most common site, but you can have internal angular also as the site. And we all know when to operate before the lesion ruptures. We want to kind of you know take those out. Maybe when the child starts going to school. Uh, but these are some of the little atypical dermoids which we should be aware of, which can happen or occur in the posterior orbit rather than in the anterior orbit. Since we are talking about the tumors of the posterior orbit, this is one tumor or rather a tumor-like lesion that we should know of, uh, which sometimes can masquerade or you know, the imaging appearance can be something which might not look like a typical dermoid. And generally, it does not present in very early childhood. It's usually a little later on in life in early adulthood where the purpose starts coming in. It's usually an axial or an abaxial proptosis depending on the location of the dermoid, and portal being a much more common location. And if you see the imaging, you have all the signs of the, any long-standing lesion, excavation of the bone, fossa formation. And the lesion sometimes almost looks like you have a you know, solid content, then you have the fat, and that gives like uh, the appearance of what we see in vascular lesion, like a fluid level or a fluid uh, ear level or other kind of. Uh, basically, what you see is more like a, a two different components, which is two different image, uh, appearance on the image. Uh, so some of these lesions can have extension into the temporal fossa, uh, which can uh, what make it something what we call as a dumbbell dermoid. And it's important to recognize this entity because if you leave behind the part which is outside the orbit and just take out the orbital component, then there will surely be a recurrence. And these recurrences are pretty nasty because they can cause fistula formation, a lot of exploration of the skin, chronic discharging sinus can also be one of the 
presentation. In fact, many a times they just present with a sinus on the periocular skin, uh, something what happens in chronic osteomyelitis, that's because the lining epithelium keeps on discharging that keratinized material, which is irritant and it causes a lot of inflammation. Generally, deep orbital dermoid like of this size might be difficult to remove in one go. So it's okay to open it up to marsupialize, aspirate the content, and then take out the lining epithelium in total. Idea is that you should not leave behind any lining epithelium. If you're able to take it out without opening the cyst, it's fine. If not, you can kind of, you know, open it up, aspirate the contents, and then take it out. It'll be a nice thorough wash to the oil. This was one of the dumbbell dermoid where we can see this opening in the bone through which it is extending into the temporal fossa. There is a component in the orbit, there is a component outside. So both the component needs to be taken out to ensure that there is no recurrence. Sometimes it can present as uh, long-standing cicatricial changes in the periocular area like cicatricial retraction, sometimes atropion also, if it has not been taken care of uh, at the appropriate age. The bone here, the imaging here shows the lesion going into the bone, uh, something uh, we call as intraosseous involvement or intraosseous dermoid, and a part of it is also. Uh, just one more lesion which can uh, you know, mimic uh, maybe you know, some tumor like lesion. It's not a tumor, it's a tumor like lesion, but the clue sometimes here lies with the other eye. You can see the other eye is microphthalmic. And this eye seems to have a mass lesion, but it's actually not a mass lesion. If you see the imaging, there is a large cystic lesion in the orbit, sitting in the inferior orbit, and there is a very small uh, globe which is sitting on top of it, a microphthalmic globe. So this is typically an orbitopalpable cyst and possibly the long-standing large cyst caused conjunctival excoriation and ulceration with some exposure and that gave rise to the appearance of an orbital. So all you have to do here is just uh, do a simple aspiration and do a sclerotherapy. Like, like what we discussed in the last part. Usually the medicines which are used as the ethanol amine oleate, which is not really available these days. So what we use these days is sodium tetradecal sulfate. We have already discussed this. So we'll skip the vascular lesions of the orbit and go directly into the uh, neurogenic tumors. All right. So this was the topic for the day. Like, can anybody... This is a middle-aged young, rather young gentleman who comes with a slowly progressive painless prophosis in his right eye. And this is the imaging. So anybody would like to take it and describe it, what do you think? It is? Um, the lesion she, uh, is an intracoronal lesion. Uh, basically, in the last picture, we can see it's kind of like a globular appearance of the optic nerve. Uh, in the third picture, actually, uh, it kind of seems to be arising from an optic nerve sheath. So it can be like basically a schwannoma can be my differential. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, schwannoma, okay. optic nerve schwannoma. Okay. So this lesion seems to be in the intracranial space, as Dr. Shikali is rightly pointed it out. Uh, but what is, you know, more striking is... Uh, that you know, it's, it looks like it has an appearance of, uh, it's almost there are two lesions which are connected to each other. If you see the last image, uh, it seems to be two globular or sp spherical lesions and there is, seems to be some connection between the two. So it's almost like, you know, there is something uh, what we call as beads, like a chain, you have the multiple beads, so something like that. So typically the location here is the supranasal orbit, the proptosis, that's why is correspondingly down and out. So any lesion in the orbit will cause a proptosis and a displacement of the glow in the opposite direction. You all know about it. This lesion seems uh, ISO to slightly hyper intense uh, as compared to the surrounding structure. I hyper dense rather. And uh, it seems to be close, sitting on top of the optic nerve head. But what is striking is the linear fashion of these multiple lesions, which seems to be connected to each other. So these lesions are, this appearance is almost pathognomic of an schwannoma because schwannoma basically are tumors from the sheath of the peripheral nerves. So the supranasal location is usually the schwannomas which are arising from either the, maybe the supraorbital, supratrochlear or one of those nerves, usually the sensory nerves. And that's why sometimes these patients do complain of some amount of sensation, abnormal sensation, either anesthesia or paresthesia um, in the corresponding area. So mostly in the forehead, if it is involving the superior orbit and one of those nerves which supply the forehead area. 
Otherwise, generally benign tumors does not really cause any abnormal sensation or pain. But this is one tumor where pain can be one of the symptoms, one of the presenting complaint, as well as anesthesia. Anesthesia could be uh, one of the presenting. And this imaging appearance where we see this multiple small lesions, like a bead of, uh, like you know, beads which are on a string connected to each other, going from the anterior towards the posterior orbit, because all nerves ultimately come either through the superior orbital fissure or one of the you know, foramina which is there in the superior orbital fissure. So they will be going towards the orbital apex, ultimately going intracranially. So this appearance is pathognomic often, uh, schwannoma or a neurulamoma. Right? So what do we do with this lesion? Uh, the treatment generally is uh, lead excision. Because uh, this leash out of it inside, and we have to take uh, this is another shown which has already been excised. Uh, sometimes schwannomas can have degeneration within their long standing lesion. So they can have cystic degeneration and that can give rise to this appearance, which is more heterogeneous. You see an appearance of, you know, hypodense area within this generally ISO to slightly hyperdense lesion. So this is the area of the cystic degeneration, the hypo area. And <clears throat> this conical shape again is uh, just shows that this is a lesion which is going towards the orbital apex. And this already was histopath proven. This was excised, probably uh, an incomplete excision was there. Maybe it was extending posteriorly and then she had a recurrence of this lesion. It was in the posterior orbit. Um, so the next lesion, the neurogenic tumor, uh, we all are uh, aware about optic nerve glioma. Yeah, these are one of the commonest um, tumors, benign tumors of childhood. And usually the presentation is either decrease in vision, reduce vision in the eye. Um, if it is causing optic atrophy or other changes, it's a large lesion or a slowly progressive proctosis. Generally, the proctosis is axial because the lesion is sitting in the intracranial space right bang behind the globe. So it is going to push the eyeball straight out. Okay. So typically a very fusiform lesion, which you cannot differentiate from the optic nerve, seems to be arising from the optic nerve. It's iso dense to the surrounding, to the muscle and the um, brain tissue. And so um, how do you, how do you go about uh, sort of, you know, doing further evaluation for this patient and treating them. Any, any inputs from anyone? Um, in these cases, it is important to rule out a history of uh, neurofibroma. Right. Yeah. So this history is important because we know that neurofibroma NF1 can be associated with optic nerve glioma. And the gliomas associated with the NF1 can be bilateral, can have Though they are supposed to run a more indolent course, but they can go intracranially, can be slowly progressive. Uh, so this instance is important, and it's also important to do a good systemic evaluation because NF by and large is a clinical diagnosis. So if you have the <clears throat> uh, typical clinical features of the cafeola spots, more than six cafeola spots, there are certain criteria which are given, then you have the additional use, exit, cracklings, family history. Uh, so all these features, if are, they are there, then it will confirm your diagnosis of NF. And we know that NF associated gliomas uh, observation can be one of the uh, options. Like this child had this scapular spots, he had a glioma, and we, we, we do see a symmetrical thickening of the optic nerve here. Uh, the one of the sides, the left side, seems to be much more involved, more thickened than the other side. So. The other side can have a very subtle thickening of the optic nerve. So if you carefully do not see it carefully, we might miss the involvement of the other side. So what do you, what do, you do with this lesion? How do, you, how do you go about treating this lesion? Once you have confirmed that, you know, glioma is a by and large a clinical and an imaging diagnosis. We really don't go and biopsy glioma uh, if, if it's a seeing eye. It's very unusual to go in for biopsying a glioma. So how do you go about treating this lesion? So gliomas, um, um, gliomas um, actually respond uh, to chemotherapy. Yeah. So first thing is to do an MRI also to see the extent of the optic nerve involvement, chiasmal involvement, uh, the other side, uh, the ipsilateral, uh, the other side involvement of the nerve. 
and uh, actually we can initiate uh, chemotherapy and uh, these seem to be responding well right so it depends on the age of the child and the laterality so it it's an older child uh, like this where it's an unilateral involvement and the eye does not have any visual prognosis and the tumor seems to be confined to the orbit and has not be gone beyond the extent of the orbit and if the cosmesis is main concern then you can go ahead and do an excision so here basically uh, what you are doing is you are doing excising the optic nerve so you can leave behind the eyeball simply go in just like the way we go in for enucleation go into the intragonal space uh, expose the optic nerve and we excise the whole tumor right to the posterior end of the orbit depending on the extent so that will uh, of course there is no visual potential in this eye and if you have uh, involvement of the other or if you in the process you will end up damaging the other nerves in the orbital apex that's are sometimes possibility of ophthalmoplegia and all but if the patient is or the family is very keen on retaining the globe and it is otherwise not a, is not a disorganized globe like in this child the globe otherwise was fine there was no secondary glaucoma or other signs of exposure or any other thing so they are very keen on retaining the globe so we went and went ahead and just did an excision of the glioma So that's one. Uh, if there is visual potential in the eye, uh, the second option is if there is a massive glioma, there is no visual potential. At the same time, the eye is also disorganized and there is secondary glaucoma. It's a painful eye. Then you can go ahead with an excision along with the needle. So you remove the eye wall and you take out the whole tube. If there is visual potential in the eye, then we see the extent of the disease if the tumor seems to be just confined to the intraorbital by the optic nerve and it is not going beyond the orbital apex and it's a seeing eye we just observe we really don't go and intervene we can simply observe do uh, repeat the mri at periodic interval maybe every 6 months to 1 year depending on the age and what is the anticipated progression and if there is no documented growth both clinically as well as on imaging findings we can just give the child on periodic follow up if on follow up some growth is documented which seems to be uh, growing posteriorly towards the orbital apex because you don't want this tumor to grow and reach the chiasma and the you know hypothalamic area because if that happens then the secondary changes can happen right? so before it goes intracranially you want to treat it so progressive glioma uh, depending on the age of the child if it's a very young child less than 1 year of age or if it's a bilateral involvement where you don't want to give radiation Uh, chemotherapy works very well for these patients and uh, if it's an older child again it's a progressive glioma unilateral involvement then radiation is also an, also an option and the treatment here the idea is just to stabilize the lesion and maintain the vision what the patient has uh, so this is the family and depending on the profile of the patient the treatment best option here would be to go for chemo so anybody would like to take it this is a little older child it comes with uh, this picture clinical picture it looks pretty bad a massive doctor sees with a lot of exposure of the cornea seems like quite a big growth so what do you think it is Hmm. Um, any clue about the history how long standing is the uh, uh, it is long standing they have noticed the prominent prominence of the eye for several years but recently it has sort of you know grown little faster and this history where you know the vision has gone and the exposure has happened this is just few months otherwise the eye has been prominent slowly progressing for several years Yeah, a similar case it can be pilocytic astrocytoma. Yeah, <laughs> talking about the unique tumor. Talking about the unique tumor. Your uh, internet is slightly unstable. Uh, this if was again you... pilocytic astrocytoma. This is an optic nerve glioma, very unknown. So. Can you give me one minute? I'll change my connection. Yeah, ma'am. Sure. Can you hear me, Shafali? Yes, ma'am. Sure, sure, ma'am. 
<clears throat> Subhav, if you can quickly tell our viewers um, what all should we keep in mind while examining if we have like a differential of an optic nerve lesion in our mind. So in OPD, if a case comes for mm. any optic nerve lesion, actually. Mm. So just for the benefit of our postgraduate students, what all tests do you do in OPD which can point towards an optic nerve uh, function or dysfunction? Okay. So the first thing would be to record the acuity of uh, vision. Then second, uh, we go on to measure the color vision, at least screen the color vision using the commonly ishiaras chart in the OPD. And then third is assessment of the pupillary response, uh, light near dissociation or presence of any relative afferent pupillary defect or any afferent pupillary defect. And then uh, uh, do the basic workup for any proptosis uh, and uh, uh, assessment of the optic nerve head and uh, basic would be to do a confrontation test in the OPD and later definitive would be to do a field assessment say a 24-2 or a 30-2 to know any um, uh, functional change uh, such as like if there is a structural change in the disc the same thing can be reflected onto the fields as a functional change so that is also important in assessment of optic nerve lesions. Correct. Yeah, so just like few pointers like to keep in mind if you have like a differential of optic nerve dysfunction in your mind. So don't forget the pupillary reaction, color vision. Uh, and of course, before dilating also with a 78 or 90 D, you can actually see the optic nerve head and kind of like go forward from there. So yeah, ma'am is back. So over to you, ma'am. Yeah. So um, yeah, of course, the evaluation part is extremely important because most of these are going to be clinical diagnoses. We really don't go ahead and biopsy these lesions. And sometimes they can be so subtle, if you don't have a good clinical evaluation, you can actually miss that there is something wrong with it. So we are talking about this child who seems to have a pretty unusual optic nerve glioma, but the imaging is again very characteristic. The lesion seems to be arising from the optic nerve. It has this typical fusiform shape uh, of the glioma, and there is so much of cystic degeneration around it. So gliomas can sometimes, long standing gliomas can have cystic de degeneration, which can cause a Increase in the size of the lesion, which probably happened in this patient, and that's the cause of this, you know, massive proptosis, which is otherwise unusual in a in a person. So it's not that all fungating mass that what we see are always retinoblastoma, but there can be, you know, sometimes many other orbital tumors which can present as fungating mass. Glioma is not one of the commonest one, but the imaging finding is pretty accurate. And this, of course, was an atypical presentation. Normally, we don't biopsy glioma, but this was biopsy because we need to confirm what we are doing with, with here. And uh, we can see this, uh, you know, fusiform. This was on the uh, squash and print cytology, which has picked up the this cigar-shaped cells with uh, eosinophilic cytoplasmic processes. And uh, these are very typical of uh, optic nerve glioma. All right, so this was another interesting phase. I will quickly go on to the clinical findings. Again, if somebody would like to take it. This is again a small child, young child, comes with this uh, prominence of the eye and decreased view. And these are his uh, external examination and the fundus picture. So again, we are talking about the clinical evaluation here. It plays a very important role here. In a child with a picture like this, we are definitely going to do all the visual assessment, uh, including a visual acuity, color vision, RAPD, VP, and to uh, find out uh, the cause of the decreased vision. And uh, what do you think about the fundus appearance? Is it, um... Is there like a melanocytic lesion on the optic nerve head? It's I'm more like a blurring of the disc. Okay. It's a little atypical. Again, a lot of peripapillary atrophy. atrophy. Um, and there is a lot of blurring of the disc margin. It's almost like there is some disc edema. Probably yeah. he has some disc abnormality also. Now, whether the it's the, you know, he had some associated disc abnormality like an hydroplastic disc or something like that, we really don't know. But what we could make out is it's almost the whole disc uh, is little gliotic. Mm. That's, it's not even a typical edema, but it has this appearance of very uh, gliotic, translucent sort of appearance. Mm. 
So, uh, but that's what it was. So, of course, uh, in this kind of lesions, we know that we are dealing with something in the optic nerve. We went ahead and did an imaging, and this was the imaging. So, again, uh, on a very cursory look, it looks like as if the nerve is okay. Optic nerve looks okay. Uh, but if you compare it with the other side, there is definitely some thickening of the nerve per se. Mm -hmm. So it is not a very fusiform kind of that we see in typical gliomas. There is some thickening of the optic nerve. And if you can appreciate that proximal part of the nerve seems to have that kink. Mm -hmm. This is again pretty typical of gliomas. Mm -hmm. So this lesion was traced. If you trace this lesion intracranially, this is the part which is the intracanalicular part of the optic nerve, which is going and reaching the chiasma. Even that part was involved. So this was a little unusual presentation of glioma, not like a typical fusiform involvement in the orbit, but more like a diffuse thickening of the optic nerve, where the intracranial part was more involved than the part which was uh, more apparent in the orbit. So this was a more often uh, diffuse optic nerve glioma and more involvement of the posterior visual path. Um, it was a little more clearly seen here. Uh, but yes, so these are the lesions where there is already intracranial involvement. You really go, can't go ahead and do a surgical excision without causing too much of morbidity. And these patients are typically candidates for chemo. Uh, this is an elderly lady comes with a long-standing proposis, which has been slowly increasing. Uh, she has, her vision is poor in this eye and uh, she has some congestion. The, the prophecy seems to be slightly abexial, and she has RAPD also. Imaging findings and the find, fundus findings are there in front. Anybody wants to tell us the diagnosis? Optic nerve sheet meningioma. So this is pretty typical, optic nerve sheet meningioma, because okay. here if you see the nerve is here at the center, but the condition seems to be arising, but there is thickening of the sheath of the optic. So this is an optic nerve sheet meningioma, typically in middle-aged uh, females who are more commonly affected, slowly progressive, decreased vision and proptosis. Uh, this congestion was possibly because of the secondary changes due to the you know, proptosis and the exposure and the dryness. And what is characteristic is what we call as the optociliary shunt vessel. Because it's a long-standing lesion, causes long-standing compression of the vascular supply of the nerve. Uh, and the corresponding ischemia causes collateral to open up uh, between the optic nerve circulation and the choroidal uh, circulation. So this is what causes the optociliary shunt vessel formation, which are again very characteristic. Along with the optic disc color, we can also see the optociliary shunt vessels. And that just tells us that this is something which is a long-standing lesion. It's not that shunt lesions are pathognomic of meningioma. It can happen in any long-standing lesions which causes ischemia or compromise of the vascular supply of the nerve. But Typically, it's the meningioma, which is associated with the optic nerve So that was an optic nerve sheet meningioma. What about this gentleman? He again has a proptosis, things axial, again, long-standing painless proptosis, and this is the lesion, which is there on the image. So would anybody like to describe the imaging findings here? Uh, I mean, it's a heterogeneous lesion. Uh... And there's actually very typically, I can see hyperostosis of the sphenoid uh, bone. So that is very typically seen in sphenoid wing or meningioma. So my differential would be like, if you can see on the, uh, like the left eye, there's hyperostosis. So very typical of sphenoid wing and, uh, meningioma. Yeah. So this is almost like an, you know, spot diagnosis. You have a long-standing prophesis, painless, and you have this lesion where there is so much of bony sclerosis, thickening of the bone. And this is what we call as a triradiate lesion. Mm -hmm. So there is involvement. The lesion is arising from the sphenoid wing, uh, but the soft tissue component is extending towards the orbit, towards the intracranial fossa, and as well as towards the temporal fossa. So a very typical triradiate lesion, typical of a typical meningioma, uh, what we call as a sphenoid wing meningioma. And the involvement of the orbital tissues and the proptosis, compression of the optic nerve, these are secondary changes due to the soft tissue component of the lesion, which goes towards the orbit. Histopath is diagnostic, and uh, though the lesion, their uh, imaging findings is quite characteristic, uh, generally, if we plan to start these patients on treatment, it's uh, better to get a histopath diagnosis, because we know that, you know, this triradiate area can have a lot of other 
uh, lesions also. In fact, we have a full list of differential diagnosis of triradiate skull based lesion starting right from meningioma, which is one of the commonest one, then eosinophilic granulomas. If you have metastasis, you can have uh, uh, Wilms tumor, you can have neuroblastoma, and many other lesions which can mimic this radiologically. However, typically, hyperostosis of the bone is usually seen in meningioma. Most of the other malignant region will have light to visit them. So once we confirm the diagnosis, the treatment, if it's a localized lesion, generally surgical excision is the treatment of choice, but it uh, uh, usually it's the, it has to be gone, you have to go by the neurosurgical approach and excision is again done if it's causing any secondary changes, mainly because of the pressure effect, either on the intracranial component or to the orbital component. Otherwise, if it's a very slowly growing, growing lesion, not really causing any um, uh, uh, pressure effect or any other secondary changes, and it's a typical meningioma and histopath, even observation might be an option for these patients. Uh, okay, so we move on to this lady. She was a young lady who comes with this picture. She has this sudden onset vision loss. Uh, and comes with this picture uh, of the fundus. This was seen in the retina clinic, and this is what you have in front of you. And she was lactating, uh, when she saw her, she had a very recent pregnancy, and this uh, her ocular problems developed during the time of pregnancy. So basically, the fundus has a lot of changes, what we call as, you know, hypercoagulable state, a lot of hemorrhages, a lot of uh, autonomous spots, which all suggest some ischemia, which is going on in the retina, uh, flame-shaped hemorrhages and all. And there is, of course, this edema. And this picture is very typical of this ischemic appearance of the, it, there seems to be a central retinal artery occlusion, CRO occlusion, because you have the cherry red spot and you have the pallor of the posterior pole and the surrounding retina has a lot of hemorrhages. So this is basically a combined occlusion. You have the central retinal artery occlusion. As you, as you, uh, along with that, there seems to be a venous occlusion also, which is causing these hemorrhages. So combined occlusion of the um, retina are not something which is very commonly seen. Uh, it can be seen in the hypercoagulable state, but here the cause was something different. Again, since we are talking about neurogenic tumors, we know that we are dealing with something in the optic nerve. So what do, what do you think about the imaging here? Ma'am, there is a definite thickening of the optic nerve with linear enhancement along the sheath of the nerve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a very typical, what we call as the trump track appearance. So generally we read in the textbook that meningioma of the optic nerve can have this trump track appearance. So trump track, you all understand, there are the two tracks and this lucent area is the nerve in between and the surrounding the sheath gets thickened and that's what gives that appearance. And so there is a diffuse thickening here. So this was basically an optic nerve sheath meningioma, uh, but probably the pregnancy and the hypercoagulable state, which happens during pregnancy, uh, there was some vascular compromise because of the um, this tumor, which was compressed properly or causing some ischemia of the optic nerve circulation. And that combined with the hypercoagulable state probably precipitated this uh, combined vascular occlusion. And that was the cause of the vision loss. Uh, in her eyes. So she did not have too much of proptosis, very subtle one, but what is more apparent was the vascular occlusion. This is just to show the intraretinal edema in this patient and the bulge of the optic nerve. So again, these are the lesions where uh, the treatment option is radiation. Meningioma, again, otherwise, if it's not, not causing any visual problem and if you detect just uh, uh, incidental finding on an imaging. Vision is okay. You really don't have to do much. You just can simply follow up this patient. More often than not, there will be very slow growing lesion. Uh, but if it causes visual compromise like this, or again, if it is growing in size, uh, there is a possibility of growing beyond the orbit, then stereotactic radiation works pretty well in these patients, just to stabilize the vision and stabilize the lesions. So, uh, Shefali, I think this is all about the neurogenic tumors I have. So I can stop here if you wish. Yes, I believe that. If you would... want to uh, share the potpourri of your cases, it's interesting. We can keep it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so some of the other rare tumors of the orbit, uh, Ewing sarcoma and peanut are usually the spectrum of the sarcoma, um, but they also go into the spectrum of the neuroectodermal tumors. Uh, this is again one tumor in childhood which is pretty aggressive, presence with a very rapidly progressive orbital mass. Uh, 
and uh, which can kind of you know childhood rapidly progressing proptosis has very few differential diagnoses uh, the most common one if it's a very rapid progressing uh, proptosis which is progressing over a period of few days we need to rule out any uh, hematological malignancies any leukemias because we know that they can involve the orbit as uh, secondary deposits others of course are abdomyosarcoma any of the sarcomas either abdomyosarcoma ewing sarcoma or enfield so these are usually the commoner ones so this child uh, had a fairly well defined or vital mass but it was a very rapidly progressing one uh, so we uh, this diagnosis is usually confirmed on biopsy another young child here the tumor seems to be based uh, on the maxillary bone uh, usually this tumor will be bony based it's lot of soft tissue component and the imaging appearance sometimes again can be pretty characteristic you see this uh, characteristic sunray appearance of the bone because of the way the bone is getting involved and the bony destruction is happening and associated with that there is the soft tissue component and that's what is causing this maxillary fullness and the involvement of the orbit was secondary involvement here because of the uh, expanding mass lesions so these lesions do respond uh, pretty well to chemotherapy there are good chemotherapy protocols now ewing splenity is now considered as one spectrum and you treat it in a similar way splenity has a little worse prognosis chances of recurrences are more but usually the response to chemotherapy is uh, pretty good um just to move on to the mesenchymal tumors rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma we know is the commonest um, sarcoma malignant sarcoma in children again a rapidly progressing proptosis with an orbital mass so bitter orbit is supposed to be the commonest uh, side but it can involve any part of the orbit and sometimes it's very long standing lesion it can involve the whole orbit so in rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma you really don't have to chase and do a surgical excision this is one tumor where there is very good chemotherapy protocol chemotherapy as well as kind of you know combined protocol the irs protocol which we call uh, depending on the stage of the disease whether it's stage 1 2 3 or 4 uh, you can decide on what protocol and what drugs you are going to use uh, but usually in rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma the protocol for surgery is what we follow is that your surgery is usually to confirm the diagnosis so generally it's an incision biopsy but here we know that you know if you debulk the tumor if you reduce the volume of the tumor your chemotherapy is going to be more effective so if it seems to be a tumor which is fairly well defined which can be easily excised instead of incision biopsy we can go in for an excision biopsy without causing damage to the surrounding structure if it's a tumor which is massive in see excision biopsy is not possible we can debulk the tumor as much as possible again the idea here is not to cause damage to the normal structures of the orbit you just take out you don't have to chase and take it out completely you just take out whatever is possible safely and then you leave behind the rest to be taken care of by chemotherapy and adjuvant radio so it's a multi agent chemotherapy surgery radiotherapy and the overall survival is generally pretty good almost in the range of 90 95% if you detect them and treat them uh anybody wants to take this this was an elderly gentleman he came with this he initially had a very slowly progressive proptosis in fact this picture was uh when we saw him he initially came with a unilateral proptosis i, I somehow don't have the first picture here proptosis with an eyelid retraction and uh, then got lost to follow up and down the line he came back after a year with this picture where the things have definitely progressed the proptosis has become worse uh with lot of chemosis of the kind but initially it was just a white eye with proptosis with some retraction and these are the imaging pictures these are the imaging actually from the first presentation you have the histopath in front of you but you know anything any guess from the imaging and the clinical history can it be metastasis muscle metastasis yeah of course that's one possibility but usually since the history was little long this is almost like you know we saw him a year apart but the history wise it was possibly more than that two years or so maybe more than that and mats will very be very unlikely to stay like this without other symptoms and signs coming up for such a long time <clears throat> so he had any other symptom or sign other than this unilateral involvement other it was absolutely fine no other nothing else in the body so the imaging in fact uh, Thank you. what do you see on the imaging? it looks like the muscles are thick and so thick of the extraocular muscles specifically the inferior rectus seems to be pretty thick 
this referral diagnosis incidentally was thyroid disease because rightly so somebody felt that the muscles are thickening so it's a thyroid disease mm. uh, but is this thickening muscle thickening typical of thyroid disease do you see anything unusual here mm. one it's like uh, thickened in the entirety it's not like tendon sparing or uh, not just like the uh, mass of the muscle is so in the the entire muscle is like thickened and uh, yeah. it's heterogeneous also ma'am like in the lateral rectus i can see it's ma'am there is expansion of the bony orbit on that side yeah so that just tells us that this is something which has probably been there for a while for some yeah. time yeah the orbit is expanded we you know what is unusual as shikali rightly pointed out it's a heterogeneous enlargement of the muscles which is very unusual in thyroid muscles whenever they are thick and you don't see it in a heterogeneous fashion like this it almost like some of the areas are hypo dense and the rest of the area seems to be isodense so the hypo dense areas are usually either because if you have some fat within you can have hypo densities you can have like what you see in dermoid if the content the keratin content sometimes can give this appearance or if you have some mucoid mucinous material that can also give an hypo dense appearance mm. right So in thyroid, the fat deposition is usually not so localized like that. Very unusual again, and usually does not appear so high for them. So since it was not typical thyroid, so we decided to go ahead with the muscle biopsy from the inferior rectus muscle. This is what the biopsy showed. These are cells with hyperchromatic nucleus with very clear cytoplasms with very clear globules within the cytoplasm almost like what you see the you know fat globules within the cytoplasm so these were the lipoblast mm. the blast cells uh, which are very characteristic of liposarcoma so this patient eventually uh, turned out to be have uh, like the rest of the diagnosis was a liposarcoma of the orbit which is again a little unusual tumor but what was unusual was his presentation which is pretty atypical when it is liposarcoma is present as very soft ill defined mass in the lesion but what is most commonly seen in all these imaging if you see and what is been reported in the literature is the you know this hypodensity within the lesion so any lesion heterogeneous with some hypodensity within a typical of um, liposarcoma and can uh, uh, extraocular muscle lymphoma be a differential in this case yeah so lymphomas again can uh, have uh, muscle thickening isolated muscle thickening but lymphomas are usually homogeneous Mm. it's very unusual for a lymphoma to have so much of heterogeneous involvement it can involve the muscles generally lymphomas can involve a isolated extraocular muscle uh, but again it's very unusual for a lymphoma to involve all the extraocular muscles mm. without any involvement of the orbit also lymphoma tends to go along the muscle planes along the structures of the orbit so this was again uh, not fitting into a lymphoma also mm. even before the history of the diagnosis mm. so liposarcoma this patient eventually needed exenteration because you don't have any good treatment modality no chemotherapy or radiotherapy works very well for this patient so uh, exenteration is the treatment of choice for this patient is it moving my slides are not moving so that's all about the orbital tumors uh, the rest is i think extraocular retinal blastoma we you must have covered it in the rd classes we all know about the different types of the extraocular involvement it can be a primary extraocular rb primary orbital rb it could be secondary it could be an accidental rb like you know dr hanawar has this classification the five types uh, based on uh, how it has happened and uh, the treatment for protocol that we follow in extraocular retinal blastoma is a high dose tumor reduction for uh, about 12 cycles and uh, Once the eyeball shrinks, like at this stage, after three to six cycles, the eyeball goes into thysis, and that is the stage where you can go for either an enucleation or an exenteration, depending on the extent of the residual disease, and follow it up with adjuvant therapy plus follow the twelve cycles of high dose chemo. So there are many alternate protocols which are uh, now followed in different by various group, uh, whether it's a stage three or a stage four disease. But generally, what is followed in India is the high dose chemo reduction protocol, three drugs. For twelve cycles, along with surgery and adjuvant radiotherapy. So, if these diseases are localized to the orbit, the prognosis is not that bad. Survival is still not worse. But once it goes out of the confines of the orbit, it becomes stage four, 
from stage three, then the survival outcome uh, becomes pretty poor. Especially if it goes and involves the meningitis and intracranial involvement, the outcome, the survival outcome is almost uh, zero in most patients. So this is one patient where it was again, you follow it, you start with the multi uh, hydrose chemotherapy protocol, I goes into thalsis, but she still had some residual proptosis. It is not a very, you know, in this amount of thysis, you don't expect the eyeball or the to be almost to the same level as the other eye. So on imaging also, there was some residual orbital disease. We went ahead and did an excentration and followed it up with radiation therapy. And eventually you can fix up in or fit her with an uh, prosthesis. So I'm not going to the details. Uh, there are a lot of other nuances of treating orbital RD, but for resident level, I think it's important to know prevention is something which is more important than treating an orbital RD. So an early detection uh, and appropriate management often, if you are, if you have a very early extraocular retinoblastoma where there is just subtle optic nerve involvement, uh, sometimes if you just end up doing a primary nucleation for this patient, you can end up uh, leaving behind residual tumor in the orbit. And if you don't follow it up with appropriate adjuvant therapy, then the tumor can come back as a secondary organ. So a good evaluation when the tumor is in the intraocular stage Ensuring that there is no extraocular extension before you plan to go for surgery will ensure that you don't land up with a secondary orbital RD. If you do land up, do an enucleation, it's important to look at the histopath. And based on the histopath, if the patient needs further adjuvant treatment, that has to be given to prevent any relapse in the orbit or any metastasis. And if the patient presents at a stage where the things are obviously out of the or orbit because of, say, either it was not diagnosed on time or the parent did not take a consult on time, then we follow the orbital protocol of treatment. All this patient needs to have a metastatic workup also, which generally includes a bone marrow aspiration, bone marrow biopsy, and a CSF cytology. These are the two common sites where the tumor RB can metastasize uh, before we decide on any management. Yes, I think. Anything, uh, I can stop here. Yes, uh, Ma'am, I would just want you, to, uh, want you to tell our viewers something about optic nerve head tumors also, like an optic nerve head hemangioblastoma, its association with BHL, if you can just briefly briefly uh, discuss that. Okay. So uh, BHL, we all know, is in cancer predisposition syndrome, and generally the ocular findings, uh, if it's a bilateral capillary hemangioma of the retina, then the, it's, it's almost a diagnostic uh, criteria of VHL, you really don't know any further investigation to diagnose. And uh, generally, the capillary hemangiomas will involve the peripheral retina, but rarely it can involve the optic nerve head also to form a hemangioblastoma. So the terminology now is capillary hemangioma or hemangioblastoma, either is used interchangeably. I think the correct terminology now is hemangioblastoma. So uh, since these lesions are on the optic nerve head, uh, these are difficult to treat lesions. So if there is no other cause no other uh, secondary change, the vision is not compromised, there is no secondary uh, subretinal fluid which is compromising the vision, then uh, just an observation of this lesion is good enough. We really don't have to go and treat all of these lesions. But is, if it is causing uh, secondary subretinal exudation fluids coming up, which is compromising the vision, or it is seems to be involved in the optic nerve head going out, then uh, treatment modality will depend on what is the extent of the lesion. Radiation is one of the treatment options for this lesion because on the optic nerve head, uh, generally if it's a peripheral lesion, we go for plaque mm. or you can go for even laser for smaller lesions also. You can just kind of, you know, occlude the feeding blood vessels that will cause the lesions to regress or you can do cryotherapy to the lesion itself, which is again going to cause the lesions to regress. But important thing to uh, understand here is that hemangioblastomas are treated if you need to treat them. Not that every hemangioblastoma you find on examination, you just have to go and treat them. Indication for treatment is only if there is some subretinal fluid which is coming up, especially if it is compromising the vision or there are some hemorrhages or other changes which are Or else an observation is good enough. For the optic nerve head, one of the options is to go for radiation because we really can't do laser or other things in that area. PDT possibly has some role, again, depending on what is the location of the lesion, what part of the optic nerve is involved. But again, these are difficult to treat lesions and should be treated only if there is an indication. And then one last question for the evening. Uh, optic nerve head, if we see a melanocytic lesion on the optic nerve head, 
what all should we keep in mind and if suppose we are thinking of like a benign thing how should we follow up the case what all things to keep in mind in such cases so um a melanocytic lesion uh, over the optic nerve head is more often than not a melanocytoma of the optic nerve so what is characteristic is how do you differentiate the question here is to differentiate it from a more malignant lesion a melanoma rarely melanocytomas can undergo malignant transformation but it's very very rare more often than not they will be benign melanocyte so since melanocytomas are benign lesion uh, the color is something which is little different from melanoma they are more jet black unlike a melanoma which is going to be more brownish dark brownish uh, melanocytoma can uh, the pigmentation can actually extend along the nerve fibers so you can see them like the way you see sometimes the medullated nerve fibers you can have that fuzzy margin is the lesion can extend along the nerve fibers without really kind of you know distorting the architecture of the normal retina and the normal nerve fiber layer so and it's a stable lesion over a period of time if you just follow up this patient with good serial fundus photographs uh, most of them will not really grow in size and even if they grow Uh, growth can happen sometimes as part of the if it's a young child and if you detect it at a young age as the child grows there is a possibility there can be some some growth which can happen. But the other secondary changes of melanoma, like uh, fluid coming up, uh, the pigmentation coming up, the drusens coming up, right? Uh, all those things are not going to be there in a melanocyte. Mm-hmm. Sometimes rarely melanocytoma can undergo malignant transformation. Generally, when it happens, there are other changes like you know nodularity coming up within a generally flat or a placoid lesion. Any particular area it turns to grow more than the rest of the lesion. Any nodular area comes up. Secondary changes like fluid hemorrhages comes up. Then those could be one of the indicators that it could be undergoing some transformation and might need some treatment. What more often than not melanocytoma causes is something what is known as vascular occlusion because it's a lesion which can grow with the growth of the maybe the you know the child over a period of time it can cause compression of the vascular supply of the optic nerve and if that happens sometimes you can have the secondary changes like you know vascular occlusion or very rarely there can be associated uh, subretinal uh, choroidal neovascular membrane formation also associated with the melanocyte so this needs to be differentiated from a malignant transformation because the treatment is going to be totally different sure and uh, one another interesting thing that sometimes people confuse is optic nerve head drusens ma'am yeah so yeah like, those drusens are again they are basically lipoposition depositions and they can mimic um, your disc edema i think that's the reason why kind of you know they are really investigated uh, but uh, this appearance of the disc in a disc drusen is pretty characteristic it's like a bumpy appearance unlike edema which is going to be a little more diffuse with fuzzy margins of the disc so we don't see too much of fuzzy margin the disc swelling is more bumpy in drusen right and some areas you can see this localized uh, bumpiness not like a uniform thickening or the swelling of the nerve uh, and uh, if you do a fundus autofluorescence drusen can can kind of, be picked up easily on fundus autofluorescence otherwise a ultrasound examination going through the optic nerve head can also pick it up Uh, uh, as and that's how you differentiate it from a um, kind of papillary edema or a nerve edema. So if there is any doubt, you can of course go in for an imaging just to rule out any other secondary causes. Uh, but more often than not, uh, simple modalities which are available to the ophthalmologist are sufficient enough to pick them. So these are again kind of you know innocuous lesions. You don't have to do anything to them. Uh, they can sometimes come out. It's basically the buried drusens which causes this problem uh, or a confusion with a disc edema. Once the drusens comes out on the surface of the optic nerve head, then you can actually see them, and you can kind of you know, and they can come out over a period of time from the substance of the nerve to the nerve on the surface. Generally, does not need any treatment. Simply, just observation is good. Yeah, some of the interesting things that we can see on the optic nerve head because that can be seen by any of the um, like general practitioners also. So all of these things also we should keep in mind. So thank you so much ma'am thank you so much for agreeing to be with us to, uh, today it's always a pleasure to have you such an interesting discussion we had today uh, i think all the viewers would have benefited from that definitely we did very interesting uh, potpourri of cases that you showed uh, thank you so much ma'am thank you good night
Thank you. And next we'll meet on March 22nd, which is the OSCE and it will be by Dr. Keerthi Koka and Dr. Shayad Alam. Uh, we are inviting hot seaters for the OSCE. Uh, do join us because I'm, uh, I think it will be like an interesting session if all of you are online. Uh, so uh, see you all on March 22nd. Thank you, ma'am. Good night. Thank you, ma'am. Bye. Bye. Sunil ji.